Hello, everybody. Um, I'm not going to speak too long, but, but I, I would like to say, man, it feels good to be home. Um, and I don't think I will ever leave. Um, I, I echo everything Claire said about the staff here at the museum, um, and I'll, I'll add that, you know, they're amazing people, but they're family. Uh, they truly are. And there's not a day that passes I don't think about this community and this museum and the people who work here. Um, and so I've, I've really been spoiled by, by being here, and I will never leave. I'll always come back. But um, thank you all for coming. It's been such a great pleasure to uh, get to know Richard and become acquainted with his work. Um, as, as Claire said, we started this process a couple of years ago. And actually, I think the first time Richard and I met at his studio, Claire and I went up and, and met with him about this show. I think it was the week before I relocated. Um, and so, you know, we, we were talking about, well, you know, where then does this exhibition fit in? Will it happen? And, and we really wanted it to. And, and luckily, fortunately, we've been, been able to do that. Um, and one thing that I've learned is that I'm, I'm terrible at introducing artists, and I think it's because I find it very difficult. Uh, I think the best introduction for any artist is what you see on the walls, and there's, there's nothing that, that we could say to introduce an artist that's going to compete with what you're going to see they create. Um, now, I can be a good art historian, and I can give you some objective information, like you know, he received his BFA from the, the Cleveland Art Institute, he received his MFA from Washington University, he started uh, as a professor at University of Florida in 1981, uh, is the longest seated professor at the University of Florida and has had exhibitions all over the country uh, all of that time and is in numerous collections, including here at the Polk Museum. Um, and so with that, I'm going to let Richard, uh, I guess, somewhat introduce himself uh, by telling us all about his work. And Richard, thank you so much. It's been great to work with you, and I know that everyone here is really going to learn from not only what you have to say tonight, but when they come back and, and look at your work later on. So, Richard Hype, everyone. Well, thank you very much. Let's see if I can make this thing work here. There we go. Um, so what I thought I'd do tonight is really just uh, talk to you very briefly about the, the work in the show and kind of follow a format of the book that uh, accompanies the show. Um, so the show really covers uh, over 40 years worth of work. Uh, so it's, it, it, it's very difficult to try and talk about everything in that, in that particular uh, time. But I thought uh, since we, could, we can kind of follow the format of the book a little bit in kind of reverse chronological order as I, as I talk about my work. Um, you know, just to uh, uh, tell you a little bit more about myself, as, uh, as Adam said, I'm a, a professor at the University of Florida. I've been there for 37 years. I'm not the oldest professor at the university. <laughs> No, the longest seating in the School of Art and Art History. There's, there's other people that have been there longer, but I've been, I've been there for 37 years. And during that time, I've been director, I've done a lot of different things there, and I really kind of enjoyed my time there. And so a lot of the work that you see uh, in the show is actually as a result of working with uh, the structures at, at the University of Florida. Um, you know, when you go through, and I think and you, you look at the show, and you see the way that uh, I've kind of packed things into the show, I think that really kind of tells you a little bit about, about myself. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a workaholic. I, I work all the time. I see my daughter shaking her head there. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I feel the kind of need to fill things up. I get uh, very uncomfortable with sedentary relaxation. Um, I have to have music playing in the background all the time. I, everything has to be full, whether it's the walls, whether it's the painting, whether it's everything else. I, I, I kind of have that tendency to want to fill everything up. So you'll see that when you come in, come into the exhibition. Um, so what I thought I'd do is 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 uh, take you through the kind of chronologic chrono chronology of my work a little bit and talk about some of the kind of highlights of what uh, what's happened there. So, but first, I really want to uh, thank some people that really made the, made the show possible. Certainly, very big thank you to Claire and Adam in, in particular for, for uh, having the courage to kind of put this show together. You can see there's a lot of components to the show that went together uh, to be able to put it. So thank them very, very much. And as, as Claire said, the staff of the, of the museum has just been fantastic. But I really want to put a special shout out uh, to Matt 
uh, Belcher, who's the installations person, who was just absolutely heroic in kind of helping me with this and uh, just really, really excellent in, in every single part of that. Um, I also want to really thank the University of Florida and the College of the Arts. Um, you know, I'm very proud that tonight we're actually premiering this book that the university kind of sponsored, which is a book that accompanies the show and has pieces that aren't in the show and pieces that are in the show, but it, it has a, an essay by Adam in it, uh, it has a, an interview in it, it has a bunch of, bunch of reproductions in it, and uh, um, it was designed by, uh, I'll give another kind of gator shout out here, by Hatchet Design, who are two alumni from the university that I've worked with before. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here tonight. They're from Orlando, and they have two small children, and they're both sick. Uh, so I've just gotten over that, so I uh, understand how that works. So, But I really wanted to thank them a lot. And people that contributed to the book, including Adam, Laura Randall from the Rubel Collection in Miami did the interview for the book. Uh, Wally Wilson, who is here somewhere, a good colleague and friend of mine, wrote something in the book, and Chase Westfall, a former student. Um, but I really want to give a, a special thanks to my kids as well, too, to Ben and Krista. You know, they've, uh, you know, they've really, uh, sacri they've sacrificed a lot to let me, sorry. And uh, to my wife, who's been married for for 40 years. And, so. Sorry about that. That's kind of old guy thing, you know, that you get, you get, you know, to do that. You know, I've, I've told some people around here, you know, at, at the university in the School of Art, I used to be the young guy on the faculty, not the old guy on the faculty. So I, uh, so these are some of the things that have been kind of consistent with my work over the years that you'll see as you kind of go through there. Uh, idea of what I call kind of photocentric, which is all of the work is somehow based in photography, although there's no actual photography. Um, what, I, what I do is I copy pictures. I find pictures, I take pictures, I borrow pictures, I steal pictures, and I paint with an, with an airbrush, trying very hard to make things look photographic. Um, the term that is used a lot in that is photorealism, and I was never satisfied with that term because it really suggests that the photo is depicting realism, and what the photo does a great job is depicting things in a monocular photographic language. And so that centricity of, uh, surrounding photography, I think, also deals with the role that photography plays in our, plays in our culture. Um, You'll notice this, uh, this tendency of filling things up has to do with kind of layering. I don't just fill things up this way, I fill things up this way as well too. So there's frequently things layered on top of one another. You see a lot of different kind of layering going on in there. You'll notice that there's the figure pops up a lot in many different aspects of the work. I think almost every piece in the show has a figure in it somewhere and uh, deals with issues of identity and as well as kind of perception and illusion. Uh, the illusion of what a picture kind of represents and the illusion of both the kind of the illusion of, of uh, representing kind of mimicking things that aren't really kind of there. Um, you know, one of the things I think, I hope that happens in the work is that the kind of casual viewer looks at the work and initially just assumes it's a photograph. I think I try very hard to make them look like photographs. And they're done with an airbrush, which is very similar to an inkjet printer. An inkjet has a little sprayer. I just make handmade photographs. Uh, and so they're very highly crafted things, but there's no actual photography that's, that's uh, in the work itself rather than me just copying stuff. Um, to it. I'm really interested in, in the different, what I call visual language systems, all the different ways that we interpret visual matter through culture, both in terms of, in terms of art, uh, and you'll, you'll notice that in, in most of the cases, art is the subject uh, of the work itself. In some way, I'm either, again, painting other people's artwork, reflections of sculptures, referencing art. You know, it's really what, uh, you know, I've spent so much of my lifetime uh, uh, kind of teaching art, and, you know, it's around me all the time. So I think it becomes a very good kind of barometer to talk about culture when you're talking about art and talking about how we see ourselves and how we see the world through art objects. And, um, 
You know, the last thing I think that uh, kind of permeates my work uh, is uh, something that uh, Adam actually came up with the title of the show, Double Vision, that has to do with what I call the difference between looking and seeing. You know, I think we do a whole lot of looking these days and very little seeing, particularly at images. I think the, the internet and just the, the constant kind of bombardment of images uh, just turns everything into stuff. You know, I think it turns a, a painting is equal to a billboard, is equal to a screenshot. I think we've all been in museums and seen, uh, seen people take a cell shot, right, of the painting and then turn around and look at it in their phone when they've got the actual thing there. Um, and if you can just for a minute imagine the difference between looking at a painting of somebody, let's say somebody like Vermeer, uh, in, uh, where in the, in the uh, 17th century, somebody in their lifetime might see 100 images. Imagine the power an image would have then. Now it just is like stuff everywhere. And so that's a lot of what my work is about, this kind of stuff. And hopefully you have to kind of look closer and slower and, and hopefully there's a, a change when you realize there, it is a painting rather than a photograph. And I don't think that change is kind of hierarchical that makes it better. I think it just makes it different. And I think it takes time to kind of slow down and look and hopefully people really question why would somebody do this? How does somebody do this? And uh, um, what does it take to do something like that? So now I'm going to kind of walk you through, there are 10 chapters in the book, and I'm going to kind of take you in reverse chronological order and just talk a little bit about uh, some of the work in there very briefly. Again, there's a lot of work in there. There's a lot of things in the catalog. I'd encourage you to buy the catalog um, um, for the show. The, pro, the proceeds from this catalog are, are going to a scholarship fund uh, for art students at the University of Florida. So uh, it, it's, it, it all goes to a very good cause. And again, it's really a beautifully designed book. I've got to say, give it to Hatchet Design for designing this book. So the first work, chronologically, that you're going to see in the show is work that I actually did as an undergraduate student, uh, that I did at the Cleveland Institute of Art, and um, of the large portrait that's been used in the, in the show was one of the first airbrush paintings that I did, and at the time I was doing very heavily influenced by Chuck Close, doing these large portrait heads, and then started doing, again, along with a lot of other, what, what were called photorealists at the time, were doing reflections on stuff. And I started doing paintings of reflections on artwork, on sculptures that existed. And, you know, as I look back at the show and putting this together, the work that I did at this point and in graduate school is much closer to what I'm doing again today. I've kind of stripped things down. Again, I'm looking at art and looking at sculpture and, and kind of uh, doing paintings of, of that. Uh, you know, from that point, I, I kind of, I had moved to Florida and decided to kind of make a change in the work. And an, an important thing was wanting to do paintings at the time that weren't, again, weren't necessarily photorealist, but that acknowledged that the photography was the source that it wasn't realism that was the source, it was photography and it was media. You know, media has played a you know, kind of huge role, I think, in all of our lives, and particularly in my life. You know, when I was growing up in the 50s, I remember us getting our first TV, and some of my earliest memories are of TV, not, not really a family, you know, and really kind of thinking about that role, and thinking about what role media plays in our life and how culture is disseminated through media, um, and so I wanted to do things that related mo much more to the object of the photograph, and so I started doing these things that I kind of called synthetic collages. Uh, there was never a collage that exi exactly existed. These are kind of what you might call kind of trompe l'oeil paintings, kind of fool the eye paintings, again, that kind of perception and illusion. And so um, there's no real kind of torn paper here. There's no real photographs. And so it, it allowed me to stretch my uh, artistic... Uh, um, chops in a little different way that when I was uh, wanting to make like a big Durer drawing, I would just use whatever media uh, to kind of make that happen. So sometimes I wasn't just using the airbrush, although the airbrush is still the kind of primary tool that I use for that. And so it allowed me, this also allowed me to start jamming stuff together. Okay, if you think about the kind of layering, this is a layering that starts coming this way as well too, where I could take very disparate elements and then started putting them together. 
the thing that I was dissatisfied with this kind of body of work was trying to kind of really hone down on content and make everything have a very specific kind of source of meaning to it. And at this time, I just had learned about um, my, my, some of my cultural heritage. I'm a first generation. Um, I was born just a few months after my parents immigrated here from Germany. And uh, all, you know, all growing up, I thought my parents were Germans from Germany. Well, and they would talk about the old country and the place called the Bachka and Donischwabens, uh, which were uh, uh, Bavarians that traveled down the Donau River. And I found out, really, you know, after I got out of college, that they never lived in Germany until right after the war. They actually lived in a German settlement in Yugoslavia that had been, for 100 years, had been German. And they were essentially almost more German than Germans were, you know. And so, as, you know, my father had, uh, I knew my father had fought in the German army and was at the Russian front when the war ended. And this was right around the, the 50th anniversary of the war, too. And so I started asking a lot of questions and, and kind of then thinking about, well, what kind of role did, did Germany really have? What kind of role did my parents have? What kind of role did my family have? And I started doing a series of work that I called Germanic guilt symbols uh, that were really kind of exploring um, how something like that could have happened how the German people could have let something like that happen. So I started using Nazi propaganda photographs as a subject matter. If I was using a shape, I wanted the shape to have very specific meaning. So it was a shape, it was a house. If there was a figure in the middle, it was a figure of a cowering figure that was taken from an Albert Dürer photograph. Uh, the image on the right is from a Nazi bureaucrat that they're measuring a Ukrainian farmer's nose and keeping a log of racial purity. I mean, some really kind of frightening stuff that, that, that kind of happened in there. And you'll see there's, a, there's one piece of this triptych that the Harn Museum in Gainesville owns that has an image of the White Rose Group, which is from a Nazi uh, student resistance uh, group. And it's a, a photograph that was taken during their arrest. And they were arrested. And the next day, they were publicly guillotined. Uh, so uh, it's a very much of a kind of warning sign uh, about uh, how we kind of have to watch our culture. And that's really where this piece on the bottom comes from. Uh, some of you that are, that are my age or older might remember the civil defense insignia uh, that during the 50s when we were, you know, thinking about, okay, there was going to be an atomic blast, all these different places had the civil defense. You'd go down into the basement or we would go with drills to get underneath the desk, right? for the atomic blast was going to come from that. So this is an image of myself and my brother dressed in Halloween costumes with this kind of civil defense insignia. And two images on the left and the right hand side that were they're very famous images, again, Nazi propaganda images that show uh, the proper proportions for ideal Aryan youth. Um, to it, and, and layered on top of that is a symbol, is a is a template that was used at the time. And again, this is kind of pre-digital design. Uh, that was a, a template that was used for. Uh, it's called the 50th percentile template. It's what they used for furniture design to make sure everything was right in the middle um, to it. So that's uh, so that's some about that work. Um, you know, I really didn't. I really wanted the work to be much more about uh, security and fear. You know, what does it take to be secure in your home, and what do we have to kind of fear in that? But under the, the guise of that kind of subject matter, it, it, it never really got to that. It was always tissued with, with what happened uh, during the war. So then, an uh, interesting thing happened. I started kind of looking at how these kind of different kind of symbols have different kinds of meaning. So I started doing this series called Symbols and Signs. And in Symbols and Signs, I was uh, started to say, okay, I'm going to go back to working with artwork. I was using Michelangelo sculptures a lot. But there was actually a painting I did of my, of my daughter when she was like three years old, and she's wearing glasses, and she's pressed up against a piece of glass. That's something else you'll notice in the show. There's a lot of issues with glass. People pressed up against glass, glass in front of things. Again, it's this kind of layering of that picture plane in there. But there was an ophthalmologist that looked at it and saw her glasses when she was three years old and, and diagnosed it from this, from this painting. And so then I started thinking, oh, well, everybody looks at pictures kind of differently. And even when we think we know, we think we know what Michelangelo sculptures are about. But we're looking at them in the 20, 20th century or 21st century. They meant something very different when they were made. And so I started layering these kind of semantographic symbols on top of it that had, again, a kind of uh, fixed meaning, but the meaning was fixed by having to know the language of that meaning. And so the same thing was true of this, uh, 
this x-ray that I got from the university that there was obviously this guy was having some problem, big hole in his skull um, to it. And again, looking at thinking about how we, how we look and how we translate things and how by layering symbols that we don't know the meaning of, of things we think we should know meanings of, how it kind of recontextualizes all those meanings for it. Uh, you know, from seeing the, the images of, and, and, uh, of uh, with vision problems that I have, I have strabismus, passed it down to my daughter, I also have dyslexia. Um, and strabismus is an eye condition when you're little, you've seen kids that are really cross-eyed, right? So that was me, I was really cross-eyed. What happens is your brain uh, recognizes that you're seeing double and decides it's going to turn one eye off. Or you would just, you wouldn't know which doorway to walk through. And so... Uh, if that's corrected early enough, it can be your brain can, the hard wiring doesn't go there. So my daughter, we were fortunate enough to, she was in glasses when she was, I think, 11 months old, 10 months old, was wearing glasses uh, already. And so that corrects it. And so for me, uh, what that does is I see the world much flatter. Okay, which then makes drawing much easier. I could draw, always draw as a kid, and it was probably partly because of this. But I also still, that hard wiring is still in my brain. If I do this, if I look through anything that's binocular, the side just shuts off. My brain decides, okay, I'm not going to see this if I have to see two to it. And so I thought about that. That's like a cultural metaphor. And that's where it kind of came through in thinking about in these German Germanic guilt symbols that there, was a, that there was a cultural blindness that was going on there. The German people chose to ignore what was going on and kind of thinking about that as a kind of metaphor of how we think we see and we all see the same but we all see differently and, and, and really kind of thinking about that as, as ideas about how we see, how we see artwork, what we think we know, what we think we don't know but use that as a kind of metaphor for, for kind of cultural seeing or cultural blindness. Um, you know, as, as I move through these series, I either kind of, you know, I might do 10 or 12 pieces in a series, and then I'll get to a point, and I think, well, I've kind of used up that idea, or I'll see something else that will foster to want, make me want to do something else with that. And I saw a show at, actually, at the Philadelphia Museum of Thomas Eakin's photographs, and they just blew me away. I thought, okay, and when I looked into it, I found out here's this guy that was very much into technology, very much into how the photograph kind of changed the way we see and how painters could use photographs, and received a grant actually to go to the Metropolitan Museum. The Metropolitan Museum let me photograph every single Thomas Eakins piece that they had of the photographs, re -photograph. So I started doing a series of, of work that used Thomas Eakins' photographs that he never made into paintings and I was kind of making into paintings. So we decided not to uh, show these in the show. Uh, they have penises in them. So uh, we decided not to put them in the show because they hurt. <laughs> so, uh, so, but they were, again, it, and it was about, you know, kind of looking at technology and looking at photography and looking at what kind of surrounds that and how technology affects the way we see. And that's really the kind of bottom line. And, and then moved into some other work beyond that. Um, you know, I'm teaching figure painting and wanted to think about, okay, how do I do a kind of contemporary figure painting that still is an academic figure painting, like the way Eakins might have made a painting, but didn't use figure in a kind of traditional way. And I remember as a kid seeing these, uh, these visual anatomy models, you know, these clear models. I could never get them to put together without smearing glue all over them, you know? They would never turn out right. So I started collecting these an, uh, um, anatomy collections. You'll see some of my collection in the, in the gallery there, too. But then also combined those with this idea of vision and started... Uh, I actually sent out an email to every um, oculist in Florida. Oculists are the guys that make glass eyes. And... Uh, got a response from one oculist in Tampa whose daughter was an art student. And he said, yeah, I'd like to kind of work with you. And so I went down and found out how they make glass eyes and got some glass eyes. And I thought glass eyes were, again, about this kind of metaphor for seeing but not seeing. They're eyes that look like they see, but they really don't see anything. And again, there's, that, there's this metaphor for kind of not looking and seeing. So 
I started kind of layering these anatomical models, and these were actually all made, instead of from photographs, were made from scans. So I have a large flatbed scanner. I assemble this stuff on a flatbed scanner, make a scan of it, put a, photography behind, a photograph behind it, and they were all kind of historic photographs, of, again, of the figure, uh, and then scan them and then make paintings from the scan. So they have a very unique look that comes from the scan. The image on the left, you'll see that's in the, that's in the show over there. That's actually an image uh, behind it of an MRI of my spine. And it's layered on top of this, uh, or underneath the uh, uh, acupuncture model. Um, you know, as I go through museums, I look, I look at museums and I'm very fascinated by the way museums uh, the way the work is presented in museums and how it changes the meaning of the work and, and how the display and the meaning affects the way we read them. And I saw this amazing show again at the Metropolitan Museum of uh, this, this doctor who was studying physiognomy and used a photographer to a show who was actually the brother of Nadar, the other famous photographer, and did this incredible series of of portraits of these people with these electrodes stuck into their face. And he would give them a charge of electricity and it would elicit muscles in the face. And his contention was that this was, this was pure, that it wasn't really encumbered by emotions that we were getting really kind of true expression out of this. And so the images that you see are photographs of the photographs taken in the gallery, so they're what I call an index of an index of the photograph, and you see these little dots are actually the dots of the lights of the Metropolitan Museum reflecting on the, on the surface of the painting. So I've tried to, tried to mimic and copy those photographs as close as I can, and there's text on the original photographic plates, and in mine, instead of using their, their text, I've used a, a laser to etch actually into the paper uh, from, from this uh, series. And I thought they were just they're really fascinating images, fascinating images and really interesting the way that he treated male subjects and female subjects. His male subjects were very kind of clinical, describing what they did, but with the female subjects, where there's fewer of them, he started putting content into them, where it would be like a Lady Macbeth in anguish or praying nun, where the men were frontal lobe, you know, such and such and such. And so I've m manipulated some of those and those, a bunch of those in the show. Um, right about this time, I finished a, a stint of being director at school and at the university. And when I was director, it really affected my production. I couldn't paint as much as I wanted to paint, and that's the main reason I didn't want to be director anymore. I really wanted to spend more time in the studio, and I decided, okay, I'm going to kind of go back to what I was doing before, and started again kind of photographing sculptures and photographing things in museums and then painting from those things in the museum. So that's where this series of, I call them culture masks. So there's, the mask is an interesting trope that goes across many kind of cultures where you can find masks that have, have very different, and these aren't all literal kind of masks that way, but there's an image, uh, again, that's a, a painting of a photograph of Valerie Berlin's photograph that I took at the Pompidou. So it's a painting, again, a, uh, index of another kind of index, or the one on the left is there's a couple of images of that in the show is a painting of, uh, of uh, from 1220. It's actually a reliquary, a, a, a sterling reliquary that contained the skull of a saint. So it's another kind of image of the head and a representation of the head that's like a mask. And, you know, I just really love painting this kind of stuff, you know, making stuff look like it sparkles and doing all the little, you know, that's, uh, it's really kind of a meditative kind of process for me. Uh, then the, 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 uh, the last thing I think that you'll see in the show that's really kind of in the lobby is a group of paintings that are taken from photographs that I took of photographs by the German artist Joseph Beuys. And Joseph Beuys uh, was a, a fluxus artist who really was really one of the first artists to do these kind of happening kind of performances. And he has a long, he's German, has this kind of mythic kind of history around his work. He's a kind of an, an art shaman. Uh, there's a kind of mystery uh, surrounding him that he was, he was shot down when he was in the, in the Luftwaffe and that he used felt and fat to stay alive while he, after he was shot down. Well, they found out you know, there's no record of anybody being shot down around where he was or that he did this. So he kind of created this fiction about that. So there's this kind of mystery that surrounds that. What I think is, what fascinated me about the photographs I took that I made kind of paintings of is that they're 
paintings of the photographs and what you see in the glass of the photograph, you see the museum reflected in the glass. And so you're never quite sure what that space is. Are you looking at a photographic space? Are you looking at the museum space? And then in each one of these cases, you actually see the image through a silhouette of me. Uh, so you're actually seeing boys through me. So uh, these, these images, although the, I think they kind of relate to the kind of mystery of boys, aren't directly about boys. They're really about the way images are affected by the way that we see them. Um, so that's about it for the show. I thought uh, I would just end with a, a couple of things here. I've also done over the course of this time, and I've kind of retired from this for about six years ago, but I used to do a lot of public art projects as well too. So I've done 20 large site-specific public art projects. So I just really kind of give you an indication of some of those things. Uh, you'll find some of the same images that I use, the same way I kind of pile stuff together and use silhouettes and put stuff together and use neon and use light and use glass in the things that I've done. There's a, you can kind of read where they're from in there. Uh, I've done a couple of big projects at the university um, for the uh, uh, Smathers Library and Journalism Building where most of my public art projects, I don't do paintings. Uh, because I want to save those paintings for my studio time, but in this case for the university, I did a very large painting, but I do fabricated things where I have people make the stuff for me and then I kind of just hang it up after I design it. Uh, and this is a, a piece from uh, the MacDill Air Force Base. I've done projects for cities, counties, governments, federal things, and so you can see some of the same kinds of ways of combining symbols and images and silhouettes and just kind of piling stuff on top of one another. So that brings us to uh, hopefully you'll be able to kind of see the show and uh, uh, I'll be around and we'll kind of ask some questions. We're going to have a, a table set up where we're going to do a signing of the book if you'd like to purchase the book and we can, I can sign the book and dedicate it to you. But again, I just really want to thank the museum for giving me the chance to put the show together. It's, uh, we've uh, spent a very long week installing uh, every day to it and it's been but it's again it's been a real pleasure working with the museum so thank you very much